a very warm welcome and a very good afternoon to everyone. Thank you so much for joining in uh, for our session today on Ayurveda. Ayurveda is considered to be the oldest healing science. In Sanskrit, Ayurveda means the science of life. Ayurvedic knowledge originated in India more than 5000 years ago and is often called the mother of all healing. Now, we all know about Ayurveda, but how much do we know about Ayurveda is something that we are going to discover in this session. And we have a very, very special trainer uh, speaker uh, today with us, who is uh, Dr. Chaitra Rao, who is going to uh, take us through a journey of Ayurveda. And also, uh, we have uh, Gauri Seturam, who is facilitating this session for us, for Ethika. Thank you, Gauri, and thank you, Dr. Chaitra, for being here, for agreeing to do this for us. We are very, very uh, warm welcome to both of you. And uh, I want to hand over the session over to you now. Uh, thank you, Shiva, for introducing us. And uh, good afternoon uh, to all the participants who have joined us today. Um, uh, so I'm going to jump right into the session. And um, I'm hoping that Dr. Chaitra is, will bust a few myths for us today. Uh, but today's session is going to be very engaging. Uh, because sometimes um, we are going to ask the participants here to give out the answers. So this is uh, so don't uh, we don't want this to become uh, a sermon where somebody says do this, do this, don't do this, don't do this. But we are going to discover for ourselves whether we have been doing the right things or not through a small quiz. Okay. So uh, I would request all the participants here today to actively participate, give out your answers and then see whether the answers are right or wrong. All right. All right. Um, so Dr. Chaitra is indeed our expert today. And we have built this together uh, as an offering. So here we go. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll start away right away with the questions. Um, so audience, it's up to you to answer. OK, what do you think is the correct time to wake up? A, B, or C? Everybody says B. B. All right. I would hand it over to Chaitra to uh, educate us about this. Okay. So uh, I would say both A and B uh, could be taken as the right answers because uh, in Ayurveda, there's a concept called as Brahmi Muhurta or Brahma Muhurta. So, which is basically uh, 19 minutes or 60 minutes before the sunrise. So it depends on what time the sunrise is going to happen. So it changes for every cycle, for every season. So usually from 4.30 to 5.30 uh, or sometimes it goes up to 6 also for the sun to rise. So you can take both option A and option B as the right ones. All right. So 60 to 90 minutes before sunrise is when we'll have to wake up. So with this introduction, let's go on to the next one. Shreyansh says uh, both A and B. Thank you, Shreyansh. Time to brush, but what do I use? Okay, audience, up to you. Okay, there's, an, uh, there's a plethora of ABCs. Dr. Chaitra, which is the correct one? Um, so, uh, our ancestors preferred neem stick. Uh, you know, the, the middle portion of the leaf stalk uh, to be used as the toothbrush, you know, in order to clean the tooth. So nowadays, it's kind of difficult to get. So you can prefer herbal toothpaste, but the best one is actually neem stick. And if not, the second one would be mango stick because neem has that antibacterial, antiseptic uh, properties and when uh, why do we brush it's because when you sleep there are a lot of bacteria which accumulate in your mouth and that is the reason why as soon as you get up you need to brush so neem being the one which is antiseptic antibacterial and antifungal that's the best one to use but nowadays because of non-availability of neem trees itself it's kind of difficult so yeah at least you have to prefer a herbal um a toothpaste or any base. Yeah. And I think Mr. Uday is asking a very great uh, uh, question, whether we have to brush before or after we drink water. So what I'll do at this point is I will go to the Dinacharya that is recommended by Ayurveda. 
And Dr. Chaitra, if you can just take us through this cycle of the recommended dinacharya, and then we get on to understanding, uh, are we following the right habits? Okay. So dinacharya is that Ayurvedic way of daily routine, the daily regimens that one needs to follow before they start their work, before they do anything else. Okay. So the right time to wake up is the Brahmi Muhurta because it is at that point of time where there is uh, abundant oxygen concentration in the atmosphere. The weather is good. There is that very uh, fresh sun rays that fall into your body when you wake up at that time. So it is that right time where your brain, uh, you might have heard of these circadian rhythms uh, that's told in uh, modern science that, you know, there is a balance that body needs to maintain. And this, this Brahmi Muhurta is the time where that circadian rhythm and this kind of coincides. So when you wake up at that time, your uh, body cycle, your mind, body, everything will be changing to the next one at that point of time. So that is the right time to wake up. So once you wake up, you need to brush. That is the first thing that you need to do. Because as I told earlier, there'll be a lot of bacteria and uh, microbes that grow in your oral cavity uh, during the night time. So you need to make sure that you brush. And then we go through a procedure called as uh, oil pulling, or you can call it as gandusha. And nowadays it's becoming quite popular. Uh, you can do it with lots of oils or uh, certain kind of uh, drinks that you can use to rinse your oral cavity, just like how you use a mouthwash. Uh, it's that organic way of cleansing your oral cavity. Then you can go through nasya. Um, so nasya is again a very beautiful concept mentioned in Ayurveda, wherein you add medicated oils or medications through the nose because this nasal cavity has that connection to the brain directly to the nerves that go to the, uh, go to the brain. And through the nasal cavity, again, it reaches your throat so it can go to your gut as well, to your uh, stomach as well. Then it also has a direct link with your oral cavity. It has a direct link with your eyes, everything. So uh, because of that connection, there are a lot of medications that can be given through the nasal cavity. And that procedure is called as nasya. Now, leave any certain disease condition also. If you want to live a very healthier lifestyle as well, Nasya or uh, putting the uh, medications through the nose is one of the best ways to maintain your health as well. So that is one more uh, daily regimen that you can follow. Then, of course, uh, you can have your uh, drinking water or kashayas, uh, certain kadas that you can drink. Then comes abhyanga. Abhyanga is uh, wherein you massage your whole body with oil. I generally recommend my patients to do it at least once or twice a week because it makes sure that uh, instead of uh, scrubbing or going through any kind of spa, it's better to uh, ward off any kind of microbes or any kind of fungal infestations that happen to your body through medicated oils and then taking a hot water bath. And that also makes sure that your muscles and joints are intact. They become more and more stronger. And one more is um, when you do these oil application to your whole body, it kind of relaxes you as well because of the whole stress of the work. Uh, it just it gives that sense of relaxation, a sense of soothing. And then comes Vyayama. Vyayama is nothing but exercise. It's not that intense workout that a person needs to do, but there is a certain amount of exercise that a person uh, could do in order to maintain a proper health. And then comes snana, which is taking bath, which needs to be done every single day. And then uh, you can go for food. So before having your breakfast, these are all the things that one needs to do and then get back to your routine work. Right. Thank you, Dr. Chetra. On that note, um, let's understand what are the intricacies that... Um, that are either going wrong or going right. Uh, so you said we are going to wake up with the sun, uh, before the sun, <laughs> and uh, make sure what kind of uh, uh, things needs to be there for our oral cleansing. And then, but we let's say we have to gargle. Um, what is it that we have to gargle with? 
audience it's up to you now so it says a c a d b all right dr chaitra which is the correct one okay so here gargling uh, has two uh, options one is gargling to cleanse your oral cavity and gargling to cleanse your throat which is which comes behind your oral cavity so if you want to cleanse your oral cavity then i would say hot water um uh, sorry uh, if you want to cleanse your throat then hot water with salt would be the best choice but if you want to gargle to your oral cavity then not exactly hot water with coconut oil but just lukewarm coconut oil would be the best one all right all right and is this recommended uh, to be done every day and is yes. this oil pulling or is oil pulling different from this oil pulling is nothing but uh, gargling over the oral cavity just like how you use a mouthwash there okay. is a certain amount of time that you need to hold it in your oral cavity it's, it's not just rinsing and throwing it out you okay. need to keep it in your uh, mouth for a certain period of time and uh, wait until you reach that saturation and uh, so that you can take it as oil pulling but uh, gargling uh, for the throat is different that i think many of us know and many of us follow as well dr chaitra when you said you will have to hold it in your cavity uh, what does that duration look like and so it would be lukewarm oil uh, coconut oil is it yes so um, what you can do is take lukewarm coconut oil and fill it to your mouth to the extent of the size of your mouth it shouldn't be such that you're struggling to keep it in your mouth at the same time it shouldn't be such that it's too less so it should be almost the size of your uh, uh, how much you can hold it in your uh, mouth and then you can either wait without moving it for a certain period of time or you can just keep on uh you know uh, putting it from right to left and just keep rinsing your uh, mouth so you have to keep doing it until you reach that stage where you start getting a bit of tears in your eyes you know th th there is that saturation level that your body is not able to hold it anymore so it would hardly take like 4 to 5 minutes so before that you'll start getting that feeling that you can't hold it anymore so after that you are going to throw it out and just rinse your uh, mouth with hot water uh, what is the what is what is it that we derive from doing this activity okay so you brush in order to uh, take off any kind of dirt from your teeth but there are going to be lot of uh, microbes that accumulate at the upper part of your mouth as well the palate and okay. there there is going to be a lot of microbes that accumulate on your tongue as well so you need to make sure that you cleanse your whole mouth because this is the part from where you take your food so just like how you wash your hands how it is important to wash your hands before you have your food it's also important that you cleanse the part of the body from where you take the food as well all right and uh, rupa asked how about coconut oil and turmeric is that recommended uh turmeric uh, i think nowadays i mean yes you can use it but getting that pure turmeric these days is a huge challenge most of them uh, are going to be adulterated and uh, i don't think it is necessary because long term use of turmeric every single day might have its own side effects as well all right um anishu asks should we take warm water first or brush first brush first and then have warm water all right yeah we'll come to that uh, we'll come to oil specifically uh, rushali uh, tushar asks oil pulling first or brush first brush first and then oil pulling okay all right and most of the time uh, we do suffer from bad breath so um, audience members what do you think you should do to uh, prevent bad breath and i think many important meetings have also been ruined uh, because of this cooking oil with salt see all right dr chaitra what can we do to this uh, b would be the right answer because if somebody is suffering from bad breath then uh, using coconut oil with turmeric would be the best choice 
but not like every single day you know for the rest of your life it should, yeah. that shouldn't happen because if that's happening every day that means that uh, there's some internal issue with that person there's some underlying uh, health issue that the person is suffering but if it is occasional because of certain food or something that you're suffering then coconut oil with the turmeric is the best uh, option okay all right i really recommend taking a head bath every day or um, you know i want the participants to answer whether they think it's true or false i think we have a good mix of true and false dr chaitra what is it uh so it is actually false uh ayurveda does not say that you have to have head bath every single day it depends on every person it depends on the geographical location as well uh so uh, in india we practice this beautiful uh, ritual of putting hair oil before uh, uh, taking bath so that also changes based on what place you live in at the same time taking head bath also is not recommended every single day because in fact it will cause more hair fall than nourishing your hair all right all right yeah um coming to the aspect of nasya that you recommended which is uh, taking in uh, fluids through uh, our nasal cavity so audience members if it were up to you what would you do it with okay dr chaitra what is the answer what should we do it with okay so in this case i would choose b and c again depending upon the person because as i told ayurveda is not something where you treat a uh, uh, treat anybody in a general way it it is a holistic medicine so every person is different and the treatment differs so generally you can go for coconut oil just coconut oil is enough or you can also go for castor oil you can go for gingerly oil this is also very good based on in what place you live in but uh coconut oil with turmeric is also very good but if a person is running uh, i mean is suffering from running nose if there is a lot of stuffy nose because of the weather then ginger juice with jaggery is actually very good it can be a little uh, irritating to the person because ginger is quite uh, it has that pungent uh, you know smell and taste as well so it might be very irritating but especially in winter season or people who suffer from regular uh, running nose for them ginger juice with jaggery at not every day maybe at that point of time will be very good yeah and uh, vrishali asks how many drops okay it's uh, if you are practicing it as a healthy regimen then only two drops to each nostril so right. to the right two to the left two yeah i think dr chaitra at this point we would like to understand because many of them have been asking that based on different geographies right uh, we use this oil we use the other oil uh, can you throw some light on how our country has been divided in terms of geography in terms of climate and then um, tell us according to which geography what is it that needs to be used which oil and then going forward i think many of the other questions will become very very uh, transparent and understandable uh, to our esteemed participants today yeah over to you okay so uh, if you have seen uh, your ancestors using oil i mean nowadays it's very popular that we use uh, sunflower oil or refined uh, that oil this oil and all that but if you look at if you look at the historical roots of our country uh, just take a look at your look at our country's geographical uh, location if you go towards more towards the northern part of india it's more cold it's more temperate kind of weather the same if you come towards the coastal region it's always sunny it's always uh, hot there and if you come to the middle portion it's somewhat okayish right it's neither too hot nor too cold so based on that our ancestors have decided what type of oil should be given like just uh if you just observe uh, in your households keeping coconut oil during winter will have a different effect on the coconut oil that is kept it will become rancid it will become hardened and it becomes very difficult to use be it for cooking be it for hair oils everything becomes very hard 
it's because of the geographical location because the coconut oil has uh, that uh, it it can sustain up to a certain temperature so after that it becomes uh, a little hardened but if you observe the mustard oil which is uh, practiced in northern uh, the temperate parts of northern india even though uh, it reaches to a certain degree a very cold uh, condition also that sarso ka tel or mustard oil doesn't become hardened like that of coconut oil and that is why our ancestors were using it there and we were using coconut oil down south and if you observe people who live in maharashtra regions there the weather condition is different and that's why groundnut oil uh, groundnut oil was used a lot so um, and if you observe uh, like in north india it's more cold so you need something you need a oil which has a hotter potency you know which creates that warmth within your body so that you don't uh, come across any other illness so that you don't fall sick so that is why it's always good to use mustard oil in that region whereas if you come down south coconut oil has that uh, cooling effect that is why generally when you put uh, hair oil which is made up of coconut oil it gives you that soothing that relaxing uh, you know sensation also because it has that cooling effect and people who live south especially over the coastal region it's always sunny it's always hot there so it's always good to use coconut oil in that region be it for cooking be it externally for anything the same way when you come to the middle region middle part of the country it's good to use groundnut oil because for that region it's endemic to that region it's the place where that uh, plant is grown more so the soil type also is very similar to that so also the constituents that that are present in groundnut oil are quite good for that region so our ancestors have designed it, designed it in a way that it's it should help us it should have that health benefits rather than causing any other illness all right dr chaitra so now when you've told us about uh, these climatic conditions um It, uh, this oil when you have stated these oils right is it for massage cooking for all sorts of consumption right yes yes for all yeah so um uh, ziba has asked even for uh, irrespective of season ziba it would depend on where you are staying and that is the oil that you will have to use for uh, massage so for consumption for cooking for massage anything that is to do with oil it depends on which region you are staying So, Dr. Chaitra, what about olive oil? Okay, see, olive oil is something which is exotic. It's not endemic to India, right? It was uh, brought to, brought to us uh, through invasions or because of westernization. Uh, people think that it has very less cholesterol content in it, or it is very nutritious for health and all that. So that is why people have started using it. But look at, uh, I mean, I I wouldn't say that olive oil is bad. but look at the way it is used in uh, the european countries the way they cook their food is quite different from how we cook in india olive oil has um, uh, it can sustain to a certain temperature only if it goes beyond its beyond that particular temperature and if you heat it or fry it beyond that temperature it can turn toxic it becomes poisonous to your body so that is why if you observe the western cuisines western recipes they don't um, fry it like how we do it in india they shallow fry it because olive oil after that temperature becomes poisonous to your body so uh, you need to understand where to use what kind of oil so maybe for salad dressing or if you're going to prepare some pasta or anything where you don't have to fry it uh, like how we prepare our indian uh, uh, foods so then okay you can go for uh, olive oil but if you think that you can use the same for indian cooking uh, recipes also it's probably not uh, i mean it's going to be very bad for your health as well uh, uh doctor you you never mentioned sunflower oil at all but we've been seeing ads and we've been blasted right from our childhood with sunflower oil so what's up with that sunflower oil is not that good for health it's just that media uh, or that publicity that's marketing thing that's been going on uh, all around the world 
uh, you take it as it's something that lowers cholesterol or refined, pure or whatever, it doesn't have very good nutritious effect. And why do you want to ingest something to your body which is of no use to your body at all? Yes, it's become popular because it can be used in uh, South Indian recipes, it can be used in North Indian recipes, it can be used in uh, uh, other uh, international cuisine, everything it can be used, it can sustain to a certain temperature, but it does not have any nutritional effect at all to your body. So why do you want to put something that is not good to your body at all? And okay. that is like a huge myth that it lowers cholesterol or anything. It doesn't have that effect at all. All right. Okay. Everyone, please go check your kitchens. What is it that we've been consuming so far? And what is it that you would like to consume from now on so that uh, we live a much more healthy life? And what the last two years have taught us is that once it's gone, it's very difficult to get it back. So I think we need to start cleaning up our uh, shopping lists and then clean up our uh, items in the kitchen. And one way, I, I know that the, most of us are using a plethora of oils. One way to assist them is to, is to ask yourself whether this oil, the ingredients for this oil is coming from my own geography or not. So that will clear up a lot of uh, uh, questions. Like Mr. Mohan said, what about palmolin oil? Palmolin oil is uh, imported and... It, uh, I don't think it has any uh, nutritional values. Correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Chaitra. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely right. All right. Let's move on then. So we understood about oils, right? And with this background, I would request the participants uh, to come on to this journey with us. So anything that we speak from now onwards, uh, you have this background with you. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is what we also spoke about, what kind of uh, body oils to be used. And we already did it region-wise. And uh, that, uh, I would say that uh, uh, along with this, gingerly oil is also very good for uh, body massage. It's one of the best oils mentioned by Ayurveda for body massage. So you can use that as well. But many don't prefer that because it has that very pungent smell. Uh, so it's going to be a little difficult when you use it. Many don't like, the palatability is kind of bad. Uh, okay. So many people have that nausea, uh, you know, kind of vomiting uh, sensation uh, when people uh, consume it or even apply it externally. They don't like it. But in fact, it is very good for health. All right. All right. Let's go on to the next one. So we did discuss about olive oil. And... Um, Sometimes, you know, we, we are in this, in this habit of oiling and keeping it overnight. So audience members, I will ask you, what is it that you do uh, when you oil your hair or what do your family members do? Which is the most appropriate hair oil and what should be the duration to carry it over? So let's have a look at the chat. Everyone says C, coconut oil, three hours. Most of the, yeah. What about, uh, is it, is it right, Dr. Chaitra? Yes, yes, absolutely right. In fact, uh, I, I can see a few people saying it as B. Uh, B is actually a very dangerous option because castor oil is a very good purgative. It can cause you loose motions uh, if you take it internally and keeping it whole night can have uh, very bad effects. Uh, oh, no. So <laughs> as people uh, have this very bad notion that Ayurvedic medicines don't have any side effects. Uh, just try this and you will see what kind of side effects you will see. Because castor oil is actually uh, a very good, like people who are suffering from constipation can have a little bit of castor oil internally and it can cause, uh, uh, you know, a, a drastic purgative. So it's not good to keep it whole night and it's not recommended as a hair oil also. All right. Because I think we've seen a lot of uh, ads flying around that say castor oil boosts your hair, uh, boosts your eye, eyebrow growth and all of that. So none of it's true? No, no, no. Hardly you can keep it for an hour. But if you're a person who, uh, you know, uh, has this very heat sensation all the time, who cannot, uh, you know, sustain spicy foods and all that, having castor oil is going to be even uh, more bad for health. All right. All right. Okay, moving on to the next one, um, best water temperature for a bath. Uh, I know that audience members might feel like, you know, we are, we are going through very basic stuff, uh, but the basics is where we all go wrong. 
in the long term. Uh, so, Dr. Chaitra, what is this? C. Lukewarm water is the right one. In fact, Ayurveda says you should never go for very hot water and very cold water also. Uh, right. It can be very bad for your skin, very bad for your health as well. So, always go for lukewarm water. All right. Is coffee and tea to be taken in the mornings? Okay, let me twist this question up a little bit. How many coffee or tea cups do you all consume in a day? Can, can we have some number? I'll go with mine. I'll put two. Somebody says eight. Shiva says zero. Ah, oh, green tea too. Okay, we're going to bust green tea myths as well. Okay, Dr. Chaitra, what is it? What about some of us who are consuming two cups, some of us are consuming eight cups? Uh, what's happening? Uh, see, coffee and tea, as, as every doctor says, it's bad for health. Don't go for it. Uh, but if you're not able to control and if you really need to have, hardly have one cup every day, but not more than that. All right. So let's say we are trying to switch over to a healthier lifestyle. What is it that you recommend? You know, so that number one, I know that none of us here want to, um, uh, you know, give away with that morning kick that we get, that boost that we get in the morning. Uh, what can we do to get a similar boost, but not with coffee or tea? Okay. So uh, what you can go for is like certain very simple recipes that will be very tasty, very palatable. At the same time, I mean, I'm sure a few of them even have the habit of having uh, green tea and all that, which is also bad for health in okay. a long-term usage. But you can do something which is very similar to that as per our Ayurveda. So what you can do is you can take lemongrass uh, and split it into a few, uh, just the leaves, just split it into a few pieces and add it to boiling water and just switch it off. And uh, you'll get that very good aroma, a very good essence out of it. And along with that, you can add maybe one or two leaves of tulsi. Um, yeah. yeah uh, and just filter it, add a little bit of honey, uh, maybe half a teaspoon and uh, maybe a few drops of lemon and just try it out. It gives that very good sense of uh, smell. The aroma is very good and you'll feel much fresher than any coffee or tea can give. All right. What about milk in the morning? That's a great question. Milk, uh, I mean, there is actually a lot of debate on it nowadays that, you know, milk is not necessary for everybody and all that. But milk as in one glass of milk is very good, but not mixed with something else. All right. Like you mix it with some citrus fruit and make it a milkshake or you have it with coffee or something. That is not good. So if you think that you are having milk uh, along with something and you're thinking that, okay, I'm having milk every day. That will not give you the desired health benefits that a milk is supposed to give. So if you want to have milk, have it as a plain one glass milk every day. All right. Uh, one last question in this topic, wheat grass instead of lemon grass. Uh, yes, you can go for it, but uh, I don't know how palatable it will be for everybody. You can try it. I mean, it's, uh, the, it's not that it's bad for health, but using it in a very long term, uh, might not be very good. All right. Okay. Um, so what's the fuss around honey and water? You know, it has been recommended. Uh, but um, I know that we are doing something drastically wrong here also. What is it? That okay. uh, the right way. Two things. Um, honey shouldn't be added to boiling water. Honey should be never added to anything which is very hot. Okay, because uh, that is like that, uh, you know, you get honey from honey bee, right? It's there in the cools. So it is that secretion which is accumulated there that you extract and use it as honey. So if you add it to boiling water or any kind of boiling substance, it turns poisonous. It's in fact very toxic for health. It can cause indigestion and in long term, it's, it can cause you many hazardous uh, health uh, effects. So if you want to use honey, you have to add it to lukewarm water, not hot water. Oh, okay. We have some uh, really crazy <laughs> A good question here. What about hot honey chili potato? 
that's what i said it's not just with hot water it's with any food that you eat which is uh, very hot you should never add honey to it yeah all right uh because she asks uh, we have lots of choices in the market but i think this is another subject by itself where we talk about unadulterated or adulterated food uh, so we'll touch upon this a little bit later so what should be avoided as part of breakfast or lunch and dr chaitra um, i know that the audience consists of adults here and ayurveda says something else altogether about how many times an adult should consume food so can you educate us about that and also tell us what we should avoid as part of lunch or breakfast to have a great work day okay uh, so uh, starting with the how many times you need to have food so um so you need to have food when your body is that you should start having food okay your body is your signal so when you feel that hunger and you feel that your digestive a uh, system is ready to ingest some food inside you need to have food and if in general if you take having a proper sumptuous meal two days uh, sorry twice per day is enough okay so it's i mean i see in our days that um, once in two hours you keep on eating uh, a certain amount of food and then again after two hours you start eating just if you just think logically you are not giving any rest to your stomach you are not giving any rest to your gut to relax to digest that food that you have ingested so make sure that you give a certain amount of gap at least 5 to 6 hours in between once you have had your proper meal so that that meal gets digested and then have the next meal one more important thing that is to be noted is you are not supposed to have uh, um, a proper meal which fills up your stomach completely so um if you just observe you know, you are supposed to have food uh, a solid food that fills only half of your stomach and then have a liquid portion which fills the other one fourth part of your stomach so this way you would have filled three fourth of your stomach so the other one fourth is said to is supposed to be kept empty for the digestive juices to come inside for the air to come so that the food that you ingest gets digested very properly and the metabolism also happens very nicely otherwise if you just ingest uh, if you in that quadrant if you eat that solid food out of four out of four then there is no space for the digestive juices to come in for the proper metabolism as well yeah. all right all right okay um will it uh, i think this is an important question which many might have as a doubt does honey plus water plus lemon reduce belly fat <laughs> not not to a great extent not all right i mean whatever you do if you don't follow a, a healthier diet uh, i mean uh, there are many patients who come to me and say that you know give me medicines to have a weight loss when you are following a very bad lifestyle and you expect um uh, weight loss with just one medicine it doesn't happen that way you need to exercise you need to burn the fat you need to eat the proper food along with that if you follow certain regimens if you take certain medicines that is going to be conducive it it is going to help you out but if you don't follow what is supposed to be done then there is no point and lemon and honey is not the right combination in fact uh, lemon is uh, more sour in nature whereas honey is that secretion uh, that comes from the honey bee right so the combination of that is not very good in long term it can cause constipation it can start uh, people start getting gastritis gastric issues uh, a lot of um, um, motion problems as well they're not able to pass uh, stool zones all right uh, so there's a lot of hangama over um, milk consumption right um, does it differ between uh, should, do we have milk plus sugar what about uh, milk for adults is it different than the quantity that a child can drink and most importantly what about paneer okay so the quantity that a child should drink is entirely different from what an adult should drink infants they thrive they get that energy they get the nutrition from the milk so they need to have more and more milk 
and they need the calcium because when you are a kid your bones are not strong yet uh, in um, um, uh, in science we call it as ossification in the sense the bones are there but they are not settled in your body properly yet so uh, in order to strengthen those bones you need calcium you need that right amount of nutrition you need that protein so milk is the one which will provide you that nutrition so yes for infants they need lot of milk to uh, nourish their body better and milk also has that ability to uh, sharpen the brain as well so yes for kids it's very good but for adults also it is very good because it has that nutritional qualities but the amount differs the amount is very less for adults maybe one glass per day but not more than that but for infants for kids it is more and uh, coming to paneer it's a very bad notion that paneer is very good for health and uh, uh, it will boost up the energy or anything if you think logically paneer is prepared out of spoiled milk and once you spoil something and try to prepare something out of it it's never good for health so it's just uh, that loaded fat that you're taking to your body other than that there's nothing in paneer all right no proteins no i mean it's like that uh, combining all the proteins together and making it into a fat and putting it into your body all right so how often can we have paneer because you know most of our dishes are loaded with paneer anyways nowadays yeah so maybe once in 15 days once in 10 days that is fine but having paneer every single day there are many people who think that okay i'm going to do my workout today i'm going to go to gym so i need some protein so i'm going to have paneer and then go to gym or do my workout so okay. that is not going to give you any help it's just going to give it's it's just going to give you some fat to your body and there is no nutritional content also so other than that you can just have dry fruits or have some soya beans that would be even more beneficial to your body than having paneer oh all right okay yeah tushar beer is also made from spoiled rice and wheat and it is not recommended as per ayurveda thank you for uh, bringing up that point um all right uh, dr chaitra because we are on the topic of milk uh, what about uh, curds is it for kids adults does it differ yes i mean uh, for kids we generally uh, don't recommend uh, having curd because it's extremely cold and the fat the amount of fat is also much and uh, again when you see curd also it is prepared from a spoiled milk right so it is not that it is very good for health it has certain nutritional benefits that you can use it's good for health but not that you can take it every now and then especially for adults they shouldn't have it at night that is completely contraindicated because the mill uh, like nowadays we see a lot of rise in diabetes right and one of the causes for diabetes is having curd every single day there are people who have lassi every day there are people who prefer curd rice for morning afternoon and night the whole time in fact curd once it goes into your body when you take it in larger amounts it will clog all the gut it will cause that lining because it has that uh that oily content that fat content in it already right so when you have it in larger amount it will not digest the food properly it will not metabolize it so generally what i do is uh, i mean many doctors follow it as well people who are suffering from loose motion uh, or certain uh, certain uh, digestive issues we tell them start having curd rice that day because it will stop the motion it will not cause any further digestion that day so it is something which hampers your digestion if taken in larger amounts if taken in very small amounts it's okay it's good for health but otherwise it's not very good for health so i especially having at night is completely contraindicated okay all right i think there's a there's a there's a unique point that harita is trying to bring up that milk should be avoided for autistic kids but some are suggesting camel milk almond milk and all that kindly suggest a good source of protein and calcium for autistic kids uh, do we really have to um, number 1 do do they require a different uh, diet altogether no no see uh, there is nothing uh, wrong with their gut there is nothing wrong with any other issue than they have that small uh, health issue of being autistic other than that they don't have any other problem 
their digestive system is the same, their metabolism is the same. So why do you want to resort to something that is not natural to your body? So giving cow's milk itself is very good for health. In fact, cow's ghee is even much more good for them. Oh, all right. <clears throat> all right, because it does help with their mental abilities. Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, okay, what about uh, the new... Uh, my, uh, things that we see as probiotics, which is Yakult, does it, is it better than curd or is it once again propaganda? Uh, no, it's, I mean, nowadays everything comes like, it's just marketing this thing that they use. Something right. that is not uh, natural in our country. Why do you want to just forcefully ingest it? Yes. No, it's, All right. I think that's a good men benchmark to have. Whether uh, my country is growing it here, whether my ancestors have consumed it so far, and then take a decision about whether we want to go ahead with it. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. I think when we go out, we tend to eat a lot of things because we have we go with a huge party and uh, we don't know who is ordering what. Uh, so participants, what do you think is a bad combination to have? A, everybody says A. It's a little bit of B. Somebody says everything is bad. All, all, okay. In Dr. Chaitra, what is it? What's the... Yeah, all um, are the bad combinations. All are bad combinations? Yeah. Okay. It's called as Viruddha Aharas, wherein one uh, food is completely contrast to the other, that it can have very bad health effects. Like if you take up fish... It's a common uh, practice, practice by like almost all the people who consume fish. Once you consume fish, you generally don't eat curd. You generally don't consume milk also that day. Uh, usually the parents will ask them to uh, not have it, restrict them with having uh, milk or curd when they have fish. Because the qualities of fish and the qualities of curd or milk are completely contrast to each other. And it can cause very bad health effects also. The same goes for milk and citrus fruits or any kind of citrus things. There are nowadays we prepare all these milkshakes and everything out of uh, fruits. But actually, um, you know, you use some uh, certain sore substances to spoil milk, right? If you just keep, um, if you just add few drops of citrus fruits to milk and keep it like that for some time, it will get spoiled. So it's not very good for health wherein you use something which is uh, so nutritious and add it with so, such a sore substance because citrus fruits are rich in vitamin C. So adding vitamin C to casein is also not very good for health. The same thing goes to curd and bronze uh, vessel. Uh, if you can just test it at home also. If you just add a uh, little bit of curd and bronze vessel and keep it overnight, the next day when you see it, it becomes very bitter in taste because it kind of attracts all the bronze metallic contents into the curd and then it um, gets spoiled. So that is why keeping curd in a bronze vessel is also very bad for health. And of course, uh, any when you consume meat, avoiding milk and milk products is also very much essential because again, they completely nullify their <clears throat> effects. And again, meat with a black gram. Uh, it's completely contrast to each other. All right. Okay, then. I think uh, what we can remember is to consume milk products separately without mixing a lot of different things into them to change their, um, to change their nature. Uh, is that a good benchmark to follow whenever we are going and eating out? Yes. Or even yes, just yes. pairing things Absolutely. with an Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. I think, um, uh, okay, so this was the morning. So what do we do um, before bed? Uh, and at this point, uh, Dr. Chaitana, I would, uh, many of them have also told us that we cannot really wake up at five o'clock in the morning because, you know, we're working at different time zones. So to a, to a modern professional, right, what is it that they'll have to take care that they cannot compromise on irrespective of what is it that, uh, what kind of a, um, job uh, time that they are in, what is it that they cannot compromise? They should not be compromising on. So can you keep that in view and explain our night regime? Okay. So not everybody can follow that typical daily routine uh, that I have told.
but at least make sure that you have your food at least two to three hours before you go to bed. So uh, you think like you cannot have your uh, dinner before 10, then make sure, uh, I mean, if you're going to sleep by 12 o'clock at night, make sure that you have your dinner, your last meal should be before 10. So make sure you do that because your body also needs a certain amount of time for it to digest. Your food should pass through that uh, stomach and reach the intestine before you sleep. Otherwise, when you sleep, uh, if you, I am sure many of you have studied in uh, your 11th and 12th grade, the peristaltic movement of our uh, gut, wherein, uh, you know, you'll have that curve thing. Once the stomach is over, you'll have a curve thing. So the food will be moving in a curvy way. So when you sleep, that you call it as peristaltic movement. That peristalsis will be slowed down when you sleep. So if you have consumed food and it has not passed through those uh, parts of your body, then the digestion again hampers there and the metabolism will not happen properly. So you need to make sure that the food is food has reached to a certain extent. So make sure that you, you have your food at least two to three hours before uh, you sleep. And again, um, taking baths soon after having food is not good for digestion. Again, it will cause indigestion, especially head bath is very bad once you have food. So you need to make sure that you give a gap of at least one hour before doing it. And of course, you can have bath at night before you sleep. If you have come from outside or anything, just to make sure that you are you have cleansed your body properly. And exercise at night is not very good for health because uh, um, that is the time where there is a lot of uh, breeze happening. There's a lot of vayu. There's a lot of wind that moves around. So doing exercise at that time is again not very good for health. But what you can do is after having food, it's always recommended not to sit for a very long time. So what you're supposed to do is once you have your food, go around for like five, 10 minutes and make sure that you have not doing a brisk walk, but a light walk, a very rest, resting kind of walk for like five to 10 minutes and then just rest and then probably you can take a bath and sleep after two hours. All right, I think we have uh, an emergency question here. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is Mr. from Mr. Divakar. He says, he, uh, due to some skin issues, I'm taking an Ayurveda medicine recommended, suggested by the doctor and I'm taking um, Kadira Rishta Kashaya. And he says, due to my doctor being out of station, I have gone, gone out yesterday and brought the same kashaya from another brand. And I've had it one time, but today I'm feeling dizziness and vomiting and I'm having headache. What should I do? <laughs> so uh, there will be a reason why your doctor suggests uh, that medication from a particular brand. Because uh, but, uh, like, for example, the Khadira Adi Kashaya or Khadira Rishta, what you have taken, there are different recipes of it. Okay. So if, for example, company A has prepared Khadiradi Kashaya for a certain condition with a certain ingredients, then another company would have prepared it for some other condition with some other ingredient. It might have the same name, but doesn't mean that it's indicated in the same condition. So that is why it's always you need to make sure that you, you get the medicine of the same brand. Or at least call your doctor, speak to your doctor and make sure that um, you probably there might be some other company which produces for the same uh, condition. So you can go and buy that brand. So your doctor will know which company produces that particular medicine for what condition. So self-medication again is uh, very bad. All right. Um, yeah, I think uh, we're, uh, so we've covered the morning routine, the night routine. Uh, I think one important thing that we've forgotten until now that Rishali is suggesting is water. Um, so what, how much water do we consume in a day? Um, again, I would say your body will tell you at what time, uh, how much amount of water you need to take. There is no specific, this thing that you, you need to have one liter, you need to have four liters of water every day and all that, that. Uh, I think many celebrities kind of endorse these days that if you want to have good skin, you need to have plenty amount of water. It is like causing a flood inside your body uh, by just keep on drinking your water. Everything that you have eaten, all the uh, electrolytes, everything will be just flushed out of your body. 
if you just keep on drinking water. So you need to make sure that you have an appropriate amount of water that is enough to your body. Like for example, in winter season, you'll not feel that uh, thirsty to have water. So I think one liter or two liter per day will be enough. But if you go towards the summer, you'll feel a lot of uh, that sensation to have water more. So that time having four liters also will be probably not enough for certain uh, geographical region. So listen to your body and do what your body says. But if there's actually some underlying health condition because of which you're not able to have water or you're not getting that sensation to have water, then it's better to consult a doctor. But if you are quite healthy, then listen to your body and do what your body says. All right. I think Dr. what we forget to do is actually listen to our bodies. And uh, I know that, uh, you know, most of us have gone entire days. Uh, I mean, we've gone an entire day without drinking water. We might have hurried up and had breakfast. We might have hurried up and had lunch. We might have hurried up, had dinner and gone to bed, but just forgotten about uh, the aspect of water. So yeah. when you said one liter of water, I don't think most of us are doing that. Uh, so this is a good reminder. That is a good uh, benchmark to have. All right. Um, now that we've covered the basics, right? And we can keep going deeper and deeper. We can talk about skin. We can talk about hair fall. Uh, but we would like to talk about just three other conditions today to keep the focus on. Um, one is to do, and this these three things have been selected because you'll have somebody in your family go through it. All right. One is a high BP. Uh, the other one is diabetes. And there's another condition that we would talk about. So Dr. Chaitra, uh, people with high BP and low BP, what is it that they need to keep in mind? There may be th the strongest do's and don'ts of um, people taking care of them or people already having them, uh, having it, experiencing it personally. Okay. The first and the most important do and don't that comes for both is stress. Don't take stress and uh, do is... I mean, do is don't take stress and don't is don't take stress. Okay. This is one of the main reasons why many of us nowadays suffer from uh, hypertension or low or high BP nowadays. Okay. It's the lifestyle. It is the stress, be it the family stress or uh, the work stress or anything that causes this in the beginning. The next one is the lifestyle, the food that you take. The conditions like high BP or low BP doesn't come all of a sudden to your body. Okay. Uh, so it happens over a period of time. It happens for many years. And then one day there will be a spike. Okay. So it's not that, okay, now that I have a, this thing, now if I start taking certain amounts of food and if I restrict something, now it will become normal. It's what you have done all these years that you are going to face. Um, be it low BP or high BP. So uh, what I would recommend is first is lifestyle. Make sure that you're eating healthy, uh, having a healthy activity. Make sure that you do exercise every single day. And uh, uh, the other one is pranayama. Okay. If you're not able to do pranayama, at least do meditation or have an, a nice uh, uh, walk in you know, in a garden, in a very positive atmosphere. And uh, having that positive attitude also helps. And of course, if nothing works, we do have very good uh, Ayurveda medications, but uh, make sure that you don't go for a permanent medication because every year the dosage keeps on increasing because it will have its own side effect to the body and the dosage keeps on increasing and then you'll start getting heart issues. So make sure that you identify it at the earliest and get it completely cured. It's not like uh, diabetes and hypertension are uh, not reversible. It is reversible. It can be completely cured if you identify it at the earliest and get it treated completely. All right. I think many of us will be wondering, how is it that I can make myself stress-free? Uh, but I think most of the times that uh, most of the situations that we would enter into, which will become a high stress situation is things that we've not taken care of. Maybe we've not planned our day properly and we get stuck in traffic that gives rise to stress. Um, maybe um, we've promised ourselves that we would exercise and then we miss out for a week and we get angry on ourselves, which leads to stress. So most of the time, external situations and people also influence our stress levels. But maybe today is a good day to step back and say, 
what are those situations that I can control, that I can reduce the stress from? Maybe just going five minutes or 10 minutes early to a place will bring down my stress. So look at situations that are in your control and try to make them more stress-free. Maybe today is a day to um, just self-reflect on what is it that is in my control that I can take care of when it comes to um, blood pressure. Uh, so I think many uh, there are some comment chats about, uh, I mean, questions about pimples, dandruff, and all of that. And um, Dr. Chitra, correct me if I'm wrong. Most of these things that uh, uh, suggest an underlying condition that something is wrong with our body. Mm -hmm. And uh, would you recommend that they actually go meet a doctor to understand yes. maybe the pimple and the dandruff is an outcome of something else that is wrong with your body? Isn't that how Ayurveda sees these conditions? Uh, just over to you so that anybody who has these things on the top of mind can can put it put, put it to rest. Okay. So all these, uh, be it skin issues or pimples or hair fall or dandruff, will have two reasons generally. One is the external environment uh, that is causing you, the, the atmosphere where you live in. The other one is any other underlying condition. Like um, nowadays, at least two out of four women suffer from PCOD, PCOD, PCOS issues. So because of those hormonal changes, you will get a lot of uh, pimples and hair fall. There are many who suffer from thyroid issues and thyroid problems again will cause a lot of either it will cause hair fall or unnecessary hair growth as well. So that is there. And externally, when you think of nowadays, we use all these borewell uh, waters or uh, waters which have been added with certain chemicals for purifying the water and then it comes to us. So again, that also will cause a lot of skin issues and hair fall. So there is no, uh, I mean, like Ayurveda or any other science can help you to a certain extent to control it to make sure that it doesn't become very severe. But unless you make sure that you come out of these problems, external issues, these things, uh, these medications will not give you that 100% result. If you are still using uh, a very bad polluted water for uh, head bath, and if you are taking any medication and using the right shampoo, the right uh, conditioner, the right um, hair cleanser or anything, it might just help you maintain your hair, but it will not give you that nutrition. It will not nourish it to the extent that you will start getting very good hair because the water that you use is very bad. So the same goes for pimples also. If the water is bad, again, you are going to constantly keep on getting it and you'll have to every time start taking medication. The other one is if you have any hormonal changes in your body, again, you will have hair fall or pimples. So unless and until you treat that, this will keep on coming externally. Yes, we can give you hair packs or face packs, which might reduce uh, the incidence to an extent. But every three, four months, you'll start getting it because there's an underlying issue which needs to be treated. So once that is treated, this will completely stop. All right. I think we should take it up as our body sending out distress signals that something's really going wrong on the inside. Yeah. And um, I think, uh, you know, we've spent a lot of money, time chasing the correct products, chasing uh, the correct treatments for something that's going wrong externally. But um, maybe today, anybody who's suffering from this, um, go to an Ayurveda specialist and ask them, what is it that's going wrong inside? And only when I correct that inside is when uh, the results are going to show up on my hair and on my skin. All right. Uh, this going ahead. Um, what is it that you would recommend as do's and don'ts for people suffering from diabetes? What is it that we've been ignoring that will really bring a change in the way that uh, they are going about life? Okay, so uh, diabetes, as we say, um, it is again a lifestyle disorder. It is a psychosomatic disorder that we say. It is not just your body saying it. It is also your mind which is causing it. So, uh, you know, in, in movies, you will see certain dialogues where they will say it's all in the mind and everything. So that is where it, the triggering point is. And then it starts affecting, affecting your body. And since you have been following a very bad lifestyle, again, you will get diabetes. 
then again there is one more uh, um, uh, what do you say uh, like a hereditary issue also with diabetes but it doesn't mean that it cannot be cured it cannot be managed with you can manage it very well if you're following the right diet and everything uh, and make sure that you you prevent diabetes also in fact i have many patients who have stopped um, uh, the dosage i mean who have reduced the dosage of insulin injection because of taking very good home remedy uh, medications that they do every day uh, and there are many patients who have reduced the dosage of the diabetic uh, medications the english medications that they take and there are many people who get alarmed by the word that their glucose their sugar levels have spiked it might be just because of that time it need not be that clinical diabetes condition it can be just an increase in sugar level also so uh, you need to understand whether you need a lifetime medication for that or you just need to treat that particular increase in sugar levels so once you control your food itself you can control it to a great extent but you need to make sure that you prevent it as well like you can start by avoiding uh, curd at night as i said you know curd is told to be one of the main causes uh, for diabetes then uh, make sure that you don't have a lot of processed foods uh, a lot of fried items and uh, uh, you know sugar uh, content every day is also again very bad for health and there is again a very bad notion that uh, if you have uh, millets in place of rice again it is very good for health but again it's uh, it is a very uh, it has its own side effect so have everything but at the right amount at the right time make sure that you have uh, certain uh, homemade kadas every day so that you can prevent diabetes but yes it is not that it is uh, uh, not completely manageable or completely reversible every year you have to increase your dose nothing like that you can actually control it to a great extent all right uh, dr chetra i remember you telling us to oil the base of our foot mm -hmm. um so can you just explain uh, that aspect okay it's it's called as pada abhyanga in ayurveda wherein you massage the sole of your feet so there might be few uh, like maybe your parents or grandparents who are suffering from uh, very high sugar levels and who are, are on insulin or who have been suffering from diabetes since many years so once uh, diabetes goes to like 7 8 years then you start getting certain complications of diabetes which is called as diabetic retinopathy diabetic uh, neuropathy diabetic nephropathy all these are the complications of diabetes where you know get uh, cataract like eye issues or you might get uh, certain neurological uh, issues you will get certain kidney issues as well and one of them is diabetic neuropathy so wherein your uh, nerves start giving up so um what we what i generally uh, advise those patients is to apply oil be it uh, ginger oil or uh, sesame oil or um, even coconut oil as well so before you sleep at night apply oil to the sole of your both uh, both the feet and then massage it gently and keep it overnight this will help to reduce uh, diabetic retinopathy that is you know where you start getting cramps where you start getting that tingling sensation in your feet or in your nerves because of uh, increase in sugar levels so this will help to control it to a very great extent and it will also make sure that it gives you good amount of sleep and reduces the stress causes that relaxing uh, mood as well okay thank you dr chaitra i'm just putting up the screen uh, somebody has asked uh, what oil do we use for uh, the foot uh... uh you can go for coconut oil you can use ginger oil you can use sesame oil mustard oil depending upon where you live but generally you can go for coconut oil that's the best one yeah and uh, these are some of uh, the quick concoctions that you can prepare at home mm -hmm. uh, but dr chaitra will it just help us maintain our sugar levels or what do these three combinations do okay it will make sure that uh, i mean i have tried this uh, these medications on many patients who are on insulin therapy wherein you give that injection every day not just taking tablet okay so giving these medications have helped them to reduce the dosage 
of uh, insulin uh, injections that they take and the uh, sugar levels also have increased uh, considerably like there were they were uh, around uh, like 350 and all that and from there they have come to 250 200 so it's not a permanent cure but it will help you to reduce the dosage it will help you to lower the sugar levels so after that once you start taking some other med uh, i mean we put them on certain other medication which will help them to uh, like permanently i mean like manage it uh, very well all right um so we're just coming to um you know like a kitchen checklist things that we must have in our kitchen for any emergency uh, purposes things that are actually magical uh, in the way that they attack uh, symptoms help us have a much more easier uh, day uh, in case we're not able to immediately go to the doctor and this is that checklist okay and uh, dr chetra we are at 440 maybe we can go through um, how many of you have all of these things or maybe you have so we have actually Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We have about eleven items here. Uh, I don't know why it has been uh, named from H. Very sorry about that. Um, how many of these items do you have? Maybe you have five out of eleven. Maybe you have six out of eleven. All right, Dr. Chaitra. Maybe some of them have just left us from our kitchens, right? Um, for example, is a goal. Uh, maybe we don't have it. Um, so can you tell us what we are missing out on in case we don't have these in our kitchens? Okay. Um, okay. So uh, I'll just give you a few examples or uh, certain conditions where you can use it as a home remedy. Okay. So uh, turmeric. Turmeric is something which is very commonly known to everybody. So if you have any throat infection, you can go for turmeric. If you have a uh, some wound, you can go for turmeric unless it is uh, adulterated and it's mixed with some red chili powder. Otherwise, if it's organically prepared, you can use it. Or if you have some skin issue, you can use it as a, I mean, uh, instead of a bathing, bathing soap, you can use uh, turmeric with the basin floor as well. So that is also very good for health. You can use it as a face pack. You can use it in your cooking. So all these things are there. Now, Coming to Clo, it is not just used for palav or biryani. It has its own very good uh, uh, traditional uh, uh, usage as well. So if a person is suffering from uh, um, a toothache, so you can go for clove oil, the oil prepared out of clove. Or if it's an emergency, you're not able to find anything, then you can just add clove to boiling water. And that water, if you keep on uh, gargling it over your oral cavity, that also will help you to reduce uh, toothache. And if it is a very mild toothache and if you're able to bear it, if you just chew a little bit of uh, clove and keep it uh, in with a cotton or anything between your teeth, again, it will help you to reduce the toothache. You can just try it out because the moment you keep it there, your teeth will become numb for a certain period of time. It is like a local anesthesia for a very small amount of time. So it will help you to reduce tooth pain. So if you're not able to go out and get something, you can try that. Or um, uh, you can go for something called as kalonji or black cumin. Uh, kala jeera is what we say. So this is one of the very good analgesic. It's a very good painkiller. So you can use it. I mean, nowadays it's become very rare in the kitchen, but it can be used in recipes also. At the same time, it can be used as a home remedy um, substance as well. And coming to ajwain, um, Ajwain has this very beautiful uh, um, health benefit of reducing the stomach cramps or menstrual cramps that one uh, that women suffer from. So you can have this Ajwain uh, mixed with the, or roasted with ghee like a week before uh, periods and this will help you to reduce the menstrual pain to a very great extent. Other than that, even... Um, you might have seen, I don't know if it's practiced in other parts of the country, but in our uh, region, we use this Ajwain Ka water. It's called Oma water that is given to kids uh, who cry because of stomach pain every time. Because this is a very good digestive um, um, food as well. 
So this also helps to reduce any kind of abdominal pain, any pain related to stomach. It's not just for women, even for kids, even for elders also, it's very good. In even uh, this uh, coriander seeds, uh, if uh, you might have been uh, like used to using system or uh, TV for a very long time, and you, there might be people who suffer from burning eyes, uh, especially during summer, summer it's very common. So what you can do is you can uh, soak coriander seeds for a certain period of time, maybe overnight, and then just filter it. And washing your eyes with that gives you a very good cooling effect. I mean, instead of applying rose water or uh, putting eye drops or anything, just putting these water gives you very good result. It reduces the burning sensation to a great extent. And again, this is a very good antimicrobial also when taken internally. So all these are actually very good for health. Uh, should I go through all of them? No, on that note, just a minute, please. Yeah. Um, Mr. Um, Shreyans has asked that he suffers from dryness in his eye. And is there any treatment in Ayurveda for dryness in eye? And he yeah, said, yeah, yeah. very good treatment, but we need to know what is causing that dryness. There must be some reason why it is causing. So if it is a certain, uh, which uh, it has reached a certain severity, then we'll have to give certain internal medication and give them an external uh, therapy as well. But if it is not that uh, severe and if it is very mild, then with certain home remedies also, you can just cure it. Yeah, um, um, Anishu, we are answering questions and we are going in an order. Uh, just give me some time and I'll come to yours as well. Um, just finishing with Shreyan's question, he said he has a meibomian gland dysfunction. Hmm, hmm, hmm. It's something that he has to, is something that we can uh, do in now or uh, any quick suggestions for him? Okay, so uh, what you can start is with, uh, I mean, there are many people who say having carrot and all is, uh, has that vitamin A content and you can uh, uh, cure any eye disorder and all that. Yes, carrot has vitamin A content, but not that it can be used uh, medication, like a medication. So you can start by having uh, uh, drumstick leaves. That is again, very good for uh, your health. And uh, then there's suspenia leaves as well. That is also very good for uh, eyes. Then what you can uh, do, a simple thing that what you can practice is if you just uh, contact one yoga therapist, they can also teach you or uh, you'll find it, uh, you'll find many videos on YouTube. You can start practicing something called as Trataka. Okay, wherein you stare over a, a candle or a pointed region for a very long time and there are certain eye exercises that are told uh, as per uh, yoga, which is called Trataka. Uh, so that is that will help you a lot because the gland functioning needs to be triggered. So once that is triggered, it will help you cure it very well. Yeah, all right. Uh, so over to Mr. Shiva. Shiva, you can please let, let us know what are the questions that needs to be answered. Um, maybe we can take up a few. Um, sure. And then, yeah. sure. Thanks, Gauri. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chetra and Gauri for uh, doing this for us. Um, now we'll quickly move on to the Q&A section. Uh, uh, request anyone who has a question, you can raise your hand and you can ask Dr. Chetra a question directly. I can move you to the panel. In the meanwhile, I'm also uh, launching a poll uh, for your feedback. This poll will help us curate more sessions like this and, and bring more uh, wonderful speakers uh, like Chetra herself going forward. So uh, you can put your questions in the chat box. You can uh, raise your hands. Uh, and uh, we'll move you to the panel and you can ask your questions. So we have uh, Nishu who wants to ask a question, just bringing him uh, to the panel. Nishu, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, hello to everybody. And thank you, Shiva. Thank you, Gauri. Thank you, Dr. Chetra for your answers. Actually, uh, Dr. Chetra, I have a question regarding my problem. Uh, recently, I got to know about the uh, gallbladder stones in my stomach. So, tell me, is it mandatory to have the operation to rescue that problem? Or uh, can I have another options in Ayurveda? Okay. Uh, what is the size of uh, gallbladder stone as per this scan? Uh, Ma'am, actually, uh, there are multiple calculi. And the largest measuring approx 12 mm. 
Okay. So uh, no, uh, I uh, I have seen many cases which have been around 12, 13, uh, because uh, they can pass through uh, the gallbladder uh, tract. So you can get it treated rather than getting it operated. So ma'am, uh, uh, can you help me? Treatment. Can you help me out, ma'am? Can you help me out? Because I I met men with many physicians and all are uh, saying for the operations, ma'am. Okay. Uh, have you consulted any Ayurvedic physician? Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, till date, uh, I have not met any Ayurvedic phys surgeons or physicians. Mm -hmm. I have met only with surgeons, general surgeons, general physicians. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what yeah. uh, um, you can do is you can consult a nearby Ayurvedic uh, person, I mean, uh, clinician, because the, uh, I, it would take at least half an hour for me to speak to you about yeah, it, okay. the results okay. and everything. Okay, so, ma'am. Uh, it it is it is curable as per uh, Ayurveda. It so is curable. A very good Ayurvedic physician. Show them okay. your reports, and okay. uh, you'll be given uh, certain treatments for a period of time, and okay. uh, they'll make sure that the stones are flushed out of your body. Ma'am, can I can I take the help of homeopathy, please? Yes, you can go for it if you know a very good homeopathic physician. You can go for it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot, ma'am. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Nisha. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Shetra, we have uh, Varun who wants to ask you a question. Moving Varun to the panel. Varun, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah. Good afternoon to everyone. And hello, doctor. I just want to ask if, uh, you know, you mentioned about the club oil that we can use for, you know, dental problems. So I have a three year old kid and, you know, facing a lot of, uh, you know, teething issues right now. So can we use it for him as well? Thank you. Yeah, 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 what you can do is uh, you can get flow oil in any uh, uh, medical store. Uh, it will come in a very small bottle uh, and don't use it like you use any cooking oil or hair oil. It shouldn't be used in very large doses. Just add a few drops of it to a cotton and keep that cotton uh, over, that the, over that tooth wherever there is a pain. And uh, it will help you to numb the pain for a certain period of time. It is not a permanent cure though. It is just a home remedy that you can practice like a first aid so that it will uh, help you maintain it for a certain period of time. All right. All right. Thank you, doctor. Thanks, Varun. Thank you, Dr. Shetra, for that. Uh, we have uh, Girish uh, who wants to ask you a question. Girish, you can unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Hello. Hi, Girish. Uh, yeah, yes, sir. Uh, uh, good evening. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to you know, write, um, uh, is there any like uh, permanent treatment for this uh, type 1, uh, right? because uh, type 1 basically patients, they are more uh, dependent on this insulin on the daily basis. Uh, so uh, with uh, Ayurveda or any, anything can be done or uh, the reduction or any uh, like kind of research which is going on, is there any yeah. expected results? So yes, for yes. permanent treatment? Ha, it all depends on uh, the severity uh, and since how many years that person is suffering from diabetes. If it's just, just recently diagnosed and if it's been hardly a year since that they have been diagnosed, then it's very easy to cure. It's uh, completely curable. But if that person has been suffering since many years and is already on insulin, is already on a lot of medications, that would have caused a lot of complications already. So getting a permanent cure would be impossible at that time. So what that time what we can do is just help to maintain, help to control it and help to reduce the dosage. But at that point of time, it becomes very difficult to cure. But if it is recently diagnosed, yes, you can cure. Okay. Thanks. Sir. Hello. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but uh, see, uh, as per uh, the current doctor which you are consulting, so uh, without insulin, no, it is very, uh, uh, nobody can survive actually, uh, right? So I just uh, had a question by stopping insulin and uh, just taking the Ayurveda's medicines, can anybody survive? Uh, no, uh, we never ask the patient to completely stop those who are already on insulin. What we, what we start with is we start Ayurveda medication simultaneously when they are taking insulin. So if they are already on insulin, we start giving Ayurveda medication simultaneously. 
So after a certain period of time, it is not that within one or two days you will find that change because you have been suffering, you have been taking all those medications since a very long time. So you cannot expect result very fast. So after one or two months, you will see that uh, that change in the sugar level and everything. So then we slowly start reducing the insulin dosage to an extent. But yes, if they have already been taking that and if they have become completely dependent on it, then it will be very difficult for us to stop them from taking insulin. We might reduce it to an extent where it is like the minimal dosage of it. But doesn't mean that we can completely cure it. I told you, it all depends on uh, the complications that have arised because of that and how long and what is the severity and everything. Okay. Okay, and yeah, just a small question on that one. So the, uh, the current researches which are going on abroad or other countries, so any uh, like latest updates where uh, there is a permanent cure or it, it is still in trial basis, any idea on that, uh, madam, for that one? <laughs> okay, so the principles on what we treat as per Ayurveda is entirely different from modern. Like we don't um, diagnose diabetes as diabetes at all. It is just for the sake of the patient that we say that, okay, you are suffering from type 1 or type 2 or anything. Our diagnosis will be completely different, actually. So we cannot say that we are doing a research on type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes. There might be few people who are doing it, but the principles on which we diagnose is completely different. Like um, uh, if, you, if you see um, uh, this hypertension only, there is no such disease as hypertension mentioned in Ayurveda at all. Okay, so the, so the same way, there are about 20 types of diabetic-like conditions mentioned in Ayurveda. It's not just type 1 and type 2. So we will diagnose it based on our principles and based on that, if we, again, uh, doesn't mean that Ayurveda can cure all diseases. In fact, uh, there are many diseases which have been told that it's completely incurable and just leave it. Okay. So if that particular, uh, if when we diagnose it, if we feel that it comes under that category, then it is, of course, we cannot help you that much. But when we diagnose it as per Ayurveda principles, we feel that we can uh, um, treat it very well. We can get it managed really well. Then yes, we can go for that. So I don't think you'll find many research articles based on type 1 and type 2 because our uh, research is quite different from uh, what is followed in modern science. Okay, thanks for that. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks, Girish. Thanks, Dr. Chaitra. Chaitra, this is one last question before we uh, wind up the session for this evening. Is uh, Mr. Pradeep is asking, is there any remedy that uh, people suffering from sinusitis allergy can do? Because uh, they usually have a lot of sneezing, uh, uh, you know, and, and the other uh, symptoms of sinusitis, right? Anything that they can do. Okay. Um, one simple thing that they can practice is uh, taking uh, uh, this inhalation, you know, the steam inhalation every day will help them to relieve it. But again, it's not a complete uh, medication that they can do. It's just a small home remedy that they can follow. But yes, if you go to an Ayurvedic physician, it's completely curable. It's very well manageable. But again, depends on the patient because there are many people who suffer from uh, a deviated nasal septum called as DNS, wherein their nose uh, will not be straight. It will be slightly deviated inside. So there are many people who suffer from that. And those people are quite prone to sinusitis and uh, running nose like conditions always. So if that is the case, then they'll have to go through surgery. They'll have to be under constant medication. But if it is just an allergic issue, which is causing sinusitis and everything, it's uh, pretty much completely curable through Ayurveda. There's, uh, sorry, uh, there's a uh, request uh, from uh, Divakar. Uh, she says, one more last question. Can I get immediate solution for dizziness? I have since morning. <laughs> what is causing that dizziness is my problem. Oh, this is I mean, like Ayurvedic, my question. Ayurvedic, Ayurvedic medicine that she's been taking uh, uh, with a different brand. She asked a question earlier. 
हाँ 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 ओके देन आई वुड लाइक आई वुड वॉन्ट टू सी वॉट ब्रांड दे टुक एंड एवरीथिंग Uh, or it might it need not be that they have taken uh, that medication and that is causing uh, the dizziness it might be some other uh, underlying uh, health issue also which is causing it so it might be just that thinking in the mind that okay i have taken this medication so something is going to happen to me uh, so that also might be there in the mind so i have to like speak to you personally for some time and get to know what is happening Sure. So, so uh, if any one of the participants have any questions, you can just write your questions to me at the email ID that I'm mentioning in the chat box. I will uh, have them sent to uh, Dr. Chaitra. I will have them answered, and I will share the answers back with you. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, since we've uh, touched 5 p.m., uh, we'll uh, take leave from Dr. Chaitra and. Uh, Gauri also from India Shades. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Chetra and Gauri, for doing this session for us. Very, very informative. Very, very, uh, you know, like an eye opener because we do have a lot of these ingredients at home, but we do not know what we do with them. So it's been an amazing session. Thank you so much, both of you. And also, would like to take this opportunity to thank all the audience we have today. They've been wonderful. They've been. Really active on the chat box. They've been asking questions. They've been helping each other. I've seen a couple of people also suggest some other alternative therapies, uh, alternative uh, foods for different problems. Thank you so much. It's been an amazing experience uh, for me. I hope it is the same uh, with you, uh, and uh, hope to see you in our next upcoming session. Thank you so much.